archives of Prasar Bharti presents the timeless treasure of golden era. Hello and welcome to Living on the Edge. Sham Sundar of Bangalore writes, It has taken nature millions of years to create a perfectly balanced environment. But even if we stop the release of all pollutants this minute, it will take another 150 years in full spirit to reverse the damage already done. We will be cursed by the next generation, just as we cursed the previous generation and ourselves. Nothing captures the spirit of Sham Sundar's letter more than our first story from Kuttinad, Kerala. Sneha Koshi shows you how what was once considered an ecological miracle is being gradually destroyed by man. A stretch of water dotted with tiny islands, blue lagoons and paddy fields are just some of the images you conjure up when you think of Kotinad. It is these waterways and abundant canals formed by four river systems which form the beguiling backwaters of southern Kerala. These waterways gently thread their way through a narrow strip of land that separates them from the salty waters of the Arabian Sea. When these rivers empty themselves into the low-lying areas in and around the Vembanad Lake, an ecological miracle takes place. The miracle being the sustenance of an ecosystem that includes both plant and animal life despite the presence of salty seawater. It is this unique feature that led to the reclamation of nearly 19,500 waterlogged acres. Once man stepped in and decided to forcibly extend cultivation, there was a crisis. The fisherman lost his catch and the fertility of land decreased. There is no master plan. What is now required whenever, especially such an eco-sensitive region where the nature dependence is very high, even a slight intervention will create a lot of ecological imbalances. But like in every other part of India, Food was the priority and all developmental measures were focused on how to increase food production. In this case, everything depended on how the salt content in the seawater could be reduced and diverted to the paddy growing areas. 1955 saw the construction of the Totapalli spillway which was followed by the construction of the Tanir Mukam plant which became operational in 1974. The principle is simple. During the monsoon, the gates are left open and fresh water fills the lake. At the end of the monsoon, the water level starts dropping and the gates are lowered to prevent the sea water from entering. Technically sound, no doubt. But have these measures been successful? The Tanir Mukam Band has made it possible to have fresh water enabling farmers to harvest their crops all year round, provided there are no floods. That this is not a foolproof measure is obvious. The lack of clear division between seasons sees the pest from one crop carry on to the next, causing farmers to use pesticides up to seven times a year. This leads to water pollution, which is responsible for the spread of aquatic weeds, making navigation in the waterbound region difficult. But the worst hit are the fish, which get poisoned. Not surprisingly, the farmers and the fishermen of Kotinad are at war. Developmental activities were undertaken so as to enable the farmers to harvest a second or even a third crop every year. No one thought of the consequences for fisher folk in the area while farmers and fishermen are constantly engaged in a tug of war for the resources of Kutinad 
the greatest impact is being felt by the environment. Actually, uh, with the coming of the bund, though the purpose of reaping a second crop was realized, it has contributed to a lot of unexpected problems like environmental degradation. The aquatic environment of the region has been totally tampered. But can there be a solution in a place that is home to six distinct agroecological zones, each of which has its own unique resources and distinct problems? It is this question that sums up the criticism of those skeptical of the first ever initiative taken by the Indo-Dutch committee to arrest the problem. According to them, the solution lies in building another barrier to divert the flow of water so that it does not go directly into the sea and is made available to farmers on the eastern side. This allows salt water into the Tanirni Kamband and facilitates fishing. Babu Ambat, an environmentalist, believes there is another solution. Instead of uh, completely closing the uh, Tanirni Kamband, there should be uh, we should be able to um, make a schedule for uh, agriculture in the affected area. We can adjust the um, this uh, paddy cultivation and uh, both, uh, both party cultivation and uh, this uh, fishing. Tourism is definitely the win-win situation for both the groups, rather for the public. But is Kutinad ready for the onslaught unleashed by tourism? 70% of the local people have no sanitation facilities. In fact, most of the toilets here are like these, pitched directly in the water. It's no wonder then that the faecal count touches an all-time high of 500 parts per million or ppm as against the allowed standard of 50 ppm for drinking water, making it unfit for human consumption. But where is the choice when only a third of the population have access to potable water? It's problems such as these that plague everyday life and have probably blinded these people to the natural beauty of Kutinad, which leaves outsiders awestruck. Kutinad, it would seem, is under siege with no end to the deadlock in sight. A wonder of a unique ecosystem which might just fade away and vanish. Do you know that for every 10 litres of petrol that your vehicle uses, it emits 20 kilograms of carbon monoxide and other poisonous gases into the air? Just think of what that does to your lungs, and to the oxygen supply to your body. And what's worse, if your vehicle emits too much smoke, then it means that you're wasting fuel and that your engine is not performing efficiently. You can help. Get your vehicle tested for pollution control every three months. Remember, every action counts. <laughs> Still to come, eco-feminism and a rare look at the shy and elusive wild ass of Kutch. But first, here's an update. Episode 39, July 1995, Child Labour. Living on the Edge focuses on the problem of child labour. It is an open secret that child labour laws are being regularly flouted by several industries in India. January 1, 1996. Hundreds of children freed from bonded labour demonstrate in front of the Labour Ministry in Delhi to initiate steps to protect the rights of the child. January 1996. Attempts to introduce a single certificate for carpets free of child labour failed to convince a variety of groups at the World Trade Fair for carpets in Hanover, Germany. Back home, child labour is more than a desperate reality. February 1996. The Supreme Court directs the centre to state the steps being taken to curb child labour. However, no concrete policy has been formulated in this direction to date. Verdict. Just stopping child labour will not help. Unless there are other avenues available, the number of children on the street will increase without any betterment in their condition. Whether it's walking several kilometers to collect water, making do with little food, or constantly foraging for fuel wood, women in rural areas are critically dependent upon the environment. In some places, this has been transformed into aggressive protection of scarce resources, and is perhaps best exemplified in the Chipko movement, where women embrace trees to prevent them from being cut. 
But are these merely isolated incidents or do they reflect a growing female assertiveness and what has come to be called eco-feminism? Sneha Koshi finds out. तो जब भी अपन पेड़ इनके रखवाली करेंगा, नहीं हम काटने देंगे, ना काप लोग भग गए तो हम काट लेंगे, नहीं काटेंगे, हम लोग फायदा नहीं है फिर काटना हम, हम कर देंगे फिर हम कहाँ दूँ कंगा? सरकार से लड़ रहा है तो सुनाई नहीं कर रही अब क्या मरेंगे और क्या करेंगे? तो ये सरकारी कॉल, सरकार मार्टिन नीचे ज the history of the environment movement in India is filled with countless examples of ordinary women who through their determination and courage fought to save the environment and conserve natural resources. In a sense, amongst these women are to be found some of the earliest proponents of a movement to some and an ideology to others that has come to be known globally as ecofeminism. Ecofeminists claim Women have an intrinsic link with the environment because women by nature are more nurturing, caring and sensitive. And this sensitivity allows them to establish a special relationship with nature. Although there are many experts who disagree with this point of view, there are others who use it to argue that there is an intimate link between the degradation of women on the one hand and the degradation of the environment on the other. It's really to understand what are the connections, what are the common grounds between the domination over women and the domination over nature? What is it that allows women to be exploited in the same manner in which nature is exploited? What are the metaphors of thinking, the worldview, that allows rape of women and rape of nature to be equally easily uh, partaked in by people in society who enjoy power and have control over it? No. I think ecofeminism is uh, something that is uh, partly, uh, you know, it's it's a fiction. Ecofeminism is an ideology that's uh, got a great deal of appeal, mainly in the West. And uh, it's strange that it should have this appeal because it ecofeminism does not describe the lives of most women in India today, and it does not describe their lives in the past either. Though for some. Ecofeminism may be just another cliché term. It could be argued that women are far more sensitive to the needs of conservation than men, simply because nurturing and sustaining families, particularly in rural areas, is more often than not a female occupation, if you can call it that. And, when environmental degradation results in scarce resources, it is women who have to go a long way in search of more. I think in the contemporary stage of history, with centuries of division of labor, with colonialism and development having sucked men into what is called the economy of the cash nexus. What has happened is that women have been, have been left to look after the issues of sustenance and survival. And since, particularly in third world situations, sustenance depends on nature, it ends up the division of labor has left women in a situation in which culturally and historically they are far more responsible and far more aware of the value of nature and in the costs of environmental destruction. Women are the worst hit, definitely, when uh, there are environmental crises because of other claims on the environment. So when we find that forests are being cut by contractors or when we find that um, you know, large areas are going to be devastated because of, say, dams being built, then uh, women do, I think, react more strongly because they're more vulnerable. Perhaps that explains why a large number of movements in the country have seen women taking the lead to halt what could have become environmental disasters. But does this really imply that women are more sensitive to ecological needs, as some feminist authors would like us believe? It can definitely be said that given the way society has got evolved over time with patriarchal domination and with the domination of the market over the production from nature, what we do have is a bias in most situations in which women and nature stand in partnership against the destruction of market forces and patriarchal forces. When the environment is destroyed, some women are destroyed. 
and so are some men and so are some older people and children so the destruction of the environment affects everybody differently and their ability to cope with the consequences really depend on who they are not just in terms of their gender whether they are male or female but also in terms of their class position their um, access to other resources basically the power that they have and the control they have over natural resources whichever way you look at it there are no easy answers and perhaps we don't need any environmental concerns are after all everyone's problem and transcend all gender barriers M Navin of Eero Tamil Nadu writes please give me some useful information on animals it's a one line letter but it's made its point navin here's a feature on an animal who's camera shy and runs up to 50 kilometers an hour when you try to talk to him the first time i ventured onto the surface of the run a wasteland that stretches for thousands of square kilometers in gujarat's district of kutch the strange deafening silence coupled with the sight of parched cracked earth stretching for miles and miles in all directions filled me with a sense of awe The run is actually a dry seabed, a bleak, fleckless salt desert. It is said that this seabed was gradually raised by the silt of the rivers that flowed into it, possibly aided by volcanic activity in the area. On one side, the run touches the Arabian Sea. About the beginning of May, a strong southwest monsoon winds force large quantities of seawater onto the surface of the run, causing it to become almost completely inundated. These waters begin to evaporate by early September, leaving behind a thick coating of salt. In fact, this region accounts for almost a third of all the salt produced in India. However, the thick coating of salt ensures that except for a few shrubs and grasses that grow within the depressions of the run, very little else grows here, and only the hardiest of animals survive. One animal that seems to thrive in these harsh conditions is the wild ass. These magnificent beasts once roamed the dry plains of northern India in the thousands. However, shrinking habitats, poaching and disease have caused their numbers to dwindle precariously. Today, they are regarded as an endangered species and their last refuge is in the run. Wild asses usually graze in herds 40 to 60 strong, led by a dominant male. As the younger males in the group develop into adults, they must fight the dominant male for control of the group, often resulting in one or the other getting badly maimed. During the day, the wild ass grazes in the shrubs growing on the periphery of the run, venturing onto its surface only for protection and seclusion. When threatened, they are capable of running at speeds exceeding 50 kilometers per hour the sight of these magnificent beasts charging across the flat dry surface of the run is one that you are not likely to ever forget S.C. Rai of Lucknow writes, saw your program on TV for the first time. I was excited and touched by it. Want to know more about what you do and how you do it? Can I? 
Well, Mr. Rai, our last feature will give you an indication of what our correspondents need to do to get a story. If you're wondering why wrestlers are being featured in an environmental series, well, these aren't wrestlers. They are students at India's first and only Coconut Tree Climbing College in the city of Calicut in Kerala. This strange college was founded by K. N. Ramadasan Vaidya, a respected senior citizen. It is situated on a small plot of land in Calicut and is completely self-financed. The first question we thought of asking him was quite simply, why? Because, one word, the necessity is the mother of invention. We want that we are really scarcity of getting coconut climbers to climb the coconut. And uh, the coconut is really falling down to the, someone sometimes turn the head. And it is very, really a pathetic situation in Kerala now. In fact, coconut tree owners all across Kerala are perpetually looking out for climbers to help them knock their coconuts down. However, in spite of the intense demand that allows climbers to charge exorbitant rates for their professional services, very few Malayalis are being attracted to the profession. Why? There is no glamour for a job now. And uh, there is more exercise in it. And uh, even the son of a cocker climber is interested, not interested to come for this job because he is interested for white collar and blue collar jobs. So, to relieve from the scarcity, and uh, we have decided, and uh, why wife is called me. We are uh, really pathetic. Greatly motivated by his wife's comments, Mr. Vedya launched his college with much fanfare a few months ago. At present, each batch of 15 students is trained for a total of 20 hours over a three-month period in various coconut tree climbing techniques. Naturally, most of the instruction is in the field rather than in the classroom. Mr. Vedya claims that at the end of this training period, if his students have attended lectures regularly and practiced diligently, they could be waltzing up and down even the most formidable of coconut trees. One of the students dared me to try climbing a coconut tree. And so, I decided to take up the challenge. However, unless his students begin to see coconut tree climbing as a viable career option, Mr. Vedya's unique initiative might not really be the key to knocking Kerala's coconuts off their seemingly unreachable perch.